Hello again. Second part, I think, of the uh, recent DNA that I did because I see that these scriptures really dovetail together. And, and the scripture tonight, uh, if you like to look at um, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35, it's the story of the unmerciful servant, but really it's the story of an incredibly gracious and forgiving king which Jesus refers to at the end of the scripture as his father. So he's talking about his father, the king of the kingdom, and um, take your time to read through that, meditate on it a bit, look at the uh, questions that I have for you on the PowerPoint, and um, I'll come back to you again in a few moments. Let me just pray for you. Father, I just thank you that you have incredible, amazing instruction by the Holy Spirit to all of us in your word. This is a priceless book, uh, so valuable, and we just appreciate it. Thank you for giving it to us as a love letter of instruction to us that will cause us to be lifted up to where you are and live like you do. And if that's the case, we'll live in your grace and peace and joy. So bless this group, at each DNA tonight, as they discuss and share. Holy Spirit, just inspire it deeply. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've probably heard sermons on this, read the scriptures if we have a daily Bible reading. Maybe once a year you may read through this and we see Peter's amazing um, self-righteousness. He's saying, you know, how often do I need to forgive? And he's thinking in the context of Old Testament, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And he's saying, seven times, Lord, should I forgive? And pretty proud about it. And Jesus just blows him out of the water and leaves him gobsmacked in the sense that he says no not seven times but seventy times seven and Peter's going I thought I was pretty good but what is this and Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is unlimited forgiveness the kingdom of God is unlimited forgiveness seventy times seven four hundred and ninety if you do your maths but it's unlimited there's no limit to forgiveness and so he then goes on and uh, gives an illustration from um, Matthew 18 and talks about an incredibly generous king who forgives one of his servants for a massive debt. And I wonder about what this servant's doing in the kingdom, that he gets such a massive debt of millions of dollars in our terms. What was he doing? Double dealing, double dipping under the table stuff. Um, to me, he could have been possibly quite a wicked Guy, and yet, and the king would be aware when he looks at the account, saying, "Well, how did you come across all this? You know, this is very sus." But the guy falls down on his knees, pleads with the king, as you've read, and the king, who is acting justly, justice is right. He must order his kingdom with justice to maintain peace, safety order and prosperity justice is absolutely important but underlying the king's attitude is is the heart of what he really is all about and what his kingdom's run by and that's grace forgiveness and grace and the idea of the the fact that he exercises grace here is not just to be nice it's to impart to his constituents in the kingdom his attitude and heart he wants them to embrace who he is. He wants them to take the experience that he now passes on to this servant with him away and multiply it through all of his relationships. He wants the kingdom that he overrules to be run by a spirit of grace. So he exercises an extravagant expression of that here to this servant. And uh, so he, he cancels the debt. Now, this, this man is, is in the presence of the king. He stepped into the place of the king's atmosphere. All the servants stand around and they live in and experience the amazing heart and attitude of this king. And he, this man steps into that, steps into it as a man under judgment, guilty, scared stiff, and now under the threat of justice, 
is is thinking everything's sold, my family, I'm losing the light, I'm I'm dead in the water. But the king expresses something to him that he wants him to in, in, adopt. It is not just a nice expression of, of grace by the king. It's it's saying, I want you to receive this. I want all my kingdom to walk in this. So he, he releases him and forgives his whole debt. So he now walks out. Now where he is in the king's presence is the place of grace. It's a river of grace. He's carried along now. He's been cast into the river of the king's grace in this atmosphere where all the servants live, where the kingdom enterprise function, it's the heart of all the decisions, economic, um, administrative, all the factors that are going to make the kingdom function perfectly and beautifully. It comes from the heart of grace. He's now imbibed that. And he walks out blown away thinking, I can't believe this. This is unbelievable. And he's touched. So what's he do? He walks out. And then he immediately he sees a, a, a fellow servant who owes him a small amount of money, 10 bucks. And instead of him now walking in the, in the experience of what he's just embraced and felt in the presence of the king, which has stunned him, he steps out of grace, downward, let's say down, into the place of justice and judgment. He now is, is operating in another realm. And, he, and, and, and the carnal realm, the realm, justice is not carnal, as I said, justice is right, but he's now stepping into an attitude of payback, revenge, you owe me. The whole angry attitude of what's mine's mine and you owe me. And he steps out of grace into justice and judgment. And he, the guy can't pay him. He throws him into prison. He demands justice. He puts judgment on him. And he said, until you pay me back. Now the servants of the king saw it. And they are grieved. They're grieved because they live where the king lives. And, and they're sort of, let me say, probably following this guy, not being big, big brother kind of thing, but they're seeing this guy operate in the opposite spirit of what the king has now imparted to the guy. He stepped back into the old. Well, I'm going to get back what I, it belongs to me. It de- I deserve it. And they're grieved. They go back and tell the king. The king is now grieved. And it says he's angry. Now, the king is not angry like we get angry. He's not angry at injustice because... Uh, for injustice sake and therefore needs judgment needs rectifying he's now angry that the the servant hasn't adopted his heart and he's grieved his anger is based on the grief that the servant is not going to enjoy the same atmosphere as what the king enjoys he's going to step back into the old eye for an eye tooth for tooth thing which brings no change in anyone's life so he's grieved that he's not going to experience what the king experiences. And so we go on and, and we can take a bit of time on this. And he says to him, you wicked servant, in verse 32, he said, I cancelled all your debt of yours and you begged me, as you begged me, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? He's looking for him to adopt the same spirit because his kingdom will run on grace will not function effectively on on the standard attitude of justice. And it says, In anger, the master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back everything he owed. Listen, it wasn't the king's decision to throw him into the prison to be tortured. The man himself stepped out of the unlimited dimension of the king's grace and he set the bar of what his standard of life was that judgment is required, justice realm, owe me, I owe you, we'll live in that realm. Therefore, he set the bar, which now the king has to then take as the measuring stick for his judgment against the man. The man set the bar. The king now has to change the circumstances of his grace because the man now set the standard for what is righteous. And it says, do not judge lest you be judged. Why? Because we set the standard. And the king then has to step to that standard and judge us by that standard. He doesn't want that standard. He wants the standard of grace, forgiveness, mercy, 
releasing our, 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 our debtors to us from all their debt. Not talking monetarily or whatever, it's an attitude of the heart. And he's grieved by that. And you see, when we step out of grace into the place of justice, the devil is the greatest lawyer legalist there is. So if we want to step into justice, he knows then that we are in the place where he can torture us, he can torment us. He can, uh, he has the, as someone said, we're giving him the keys to our house to ransack. It's a, it's a state that God doesn't want us in. That's why the king's greed. He's saying, man, you're going to be in the place of torment. So when it comes to the place of the king's decision to put him in the jail, at hand of the jailers, it was because the guy had already chosen the place where the jailers could torment, torment him. And that saddens the king. And, and it says here, this is how your heavenly father will treat you unless you uh, forgive your brother from the heart. It's a heart issue. We may start from the head, but it's going to work into our heart. It's an act of the will. Forgiveness. And it grieves the father. I, I've got to quickly probably wind this up, but I believe that the king did not throw him into prison with the same attitude the servant dealt with his brother. And I reckon he sent emissaries every day to say, is that guy changing? Is he realizing the foolishness of living in, in this revengeful world? Is he, is he changing? Is he coming to his senses like the prodigal son came to his senses? And I, I reckon if that he was changing his attitude and heart and he was repenting, the king would have said, great, let's get him to in here again and let's see if we can just remodel and reshape this guy. Because his whole heart was that the whole kingdom run in grace. A few thoughts there. I, I'll leave it with you there and um, trust that maybe you meditate on it a bit more. Take it home with you. Meditate on the scripture and let the Holy Spirit speak to you about the place of grace. Let's just close in prayer. Father, I just thank you for your amazing kingdom. This kingdom is not a matter of laws and ethics. It's a matter of a spirit of what heaven's all about, what you're all about. You did not send these stories to instruct us how we should live and to adopt a, an ethic or a way or a manner or a cultural way. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual revelation. It's a spiritual change. It's, it's heaven in our hearts. And operating in that spirit releases us into the same joy and atmosphere that you live in all the time. So teach us. Help us. Embrace us. Touch us. And cleanse us from the automatic justice, demanding justice attitude. Justice is right, but Lord, grace overrules. Even as you said in the scripture, mercy rejoices over ju ju judgment. Mercy rejoices. Both are right, but mercy is so exceedingly, exceptionally high above that and brings us into the liberty and joy that we can walk in daily that you enjoy all the time. All you want to do is bring us up to where you live and, and cause us to share in the, in the exceptional joy of living in your kingdom. So bless each one now as they meditate and consider these things again. And anyone who's having struggles with this, Lord, just help them through in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope that's good for you. I enjoy sharing this message and um, trust that you will also enjoy thinking about it all over again. God bless you. Bye.